Good morning. I am Bob Bednarz, your host of Bob's Coffee Chat. Today's program is called Understanding Anxiety in Times of Stress. I would like to introduce today's presenters, Elaine Friend and Daniel Martin. Elaine Friend is a licensed marriage and family therapist and international consultant for highly sensitive people, otherwise known as HSPs. Elaine holds master's degrees in both clinical psychology and school counseling. Elaine's talk at Google, Understanding the Highly Sensitive Person, is a widely recognized resource. Her unique programs include HSPs and horses and online sensitivity circles. Daniel Martin is an acupuncturist in Marin County, California. Daniel has an MS degree from American College of Traditional Medicine in San Francisco. Daniel, Daniel chose acupuncture as a career after being a longtime sufferer of digestive problems, allergies, and neck and shoulder pains. Acupuncture has led Daniel from medication to meditation. So Elaine and Daniel, I will now turn the presentation over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so Daniel, Bob really introduced us well. So I, I'm gonna skip my introduction <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and send you on, go for it. <laughs> okay, so what I wanna do folks is first just outline our talk and then we'll jump right into it. So today, what we wanna do is, we actually wanna give you lots of tools um, to cope with anxiety and stress and give you an overview from both a medical perspective and um, a therapeutic perspective, how to, how to think about stress. Um, and throughout that, we'll, we'll, we'll intersperse that with um, tools an acupuncture and traditional Chinese medicine perspective and a, and a therapeutic perspective. So Elaine, do you wanna start us off with a practice? I will indeed. I'm just going to invite everybody to start off by closing your eyes. It turns out that our eyes are the place where we get 80% of our sensory input. So if we just close our eyes for 30 seconds, what will happen is we will move down the over arousal and in, into op optimal level of arousal. And for this moment, while your eyes are closed, I want to invite you just to sink into the chair or the floor or wherever you are and feel gravity pulling on you. Now, since just by having your eyes closed, we're achieving exactly what you need to achieve, I'm going to tell you a technique that you can do later, or you can do it now. I'm fine. You're welcome to turn your videos off as well. I invite you to turn your video off and just um, let yourself be experiencing until we go back into more conversation. If you lay down on your back with your legs up on the wall, say you could do it on your bed and your legs are up against your headboard or on the floor and your legs are up against the wall in whatever way is comfortable for you. Keep your feet up there and your eyes closed for three minutes and it equals a 30 minute nap. Isn't that absolutely amazing? I, there's nothing better in my book. So that's our 30 seconds. And I'm going to just um, take a moment to pop into a little bit of um, some definitions for us to get us started. I have a screen share on if you wanna look, you can look, if not, it's totally fine. I love this picture of this cat because you know, for me, sometimes I can't tell the difference between when I'm anxious, when I'm having anxiety or stress, and when I'm actually flying high and doing a really good job because that, that tension and that energy brings me to a place of being able to really perform like I'm doing right now. It's later that I'm gonna be exhausted. I threw this picture in of uh, three of my equine colleagues um, with their eyes closed, just napping and shutting out their overstimulation. Um, this is in the middle of a retreat. Anxiety means a lot of different things for a lot of different people. So we're gonna talk about it in a colloquial sense and also in a more diagnostic sense today. I like to think of this, this image of a stress meter. So, you know, at the bottom, you're just relaxed. You're then next, things are starting to happen in your life and you're coping, but you're okay. You start to feel stressed. You're becoming a little bit more over aroused and having the symptoms that we'll talk about in a moment of anxiety. Anxiety is, has a really specific definition in the diagnostic and statistical manual that medical professionals, especially psychologists use. And at the top is a panic attack. Not everybody has panic attacks, but that's when anxiety has taken control and no longer do you have any control over it. 
I've said this term a couple of times already, optimal level of arousal or over arousal. It's the psychological term, which means that in your, your body is literally becoming aroused. Your heart rate is going up. Your, um, maybe you, you warm up, your breathing becomes more shallow or more rapid when you aren't at optimal level of arousal. However, you can also be under aroused, say you're bored or underwhelmed, or you're kind of in a more depressive mode, and then you need to seek stimulation. So when you're at optimal level of arousal, that's when you're going to be your best self. I like to call that coming home to myself. And that's where I like to try to stay or at least return after I move up the anxiety thermometer, as you saw. So these are the symptoms of anxiety. It can include edginess, tiring easily, um, difficulty with concentration, irritability. I'm good at that one. Um, increased muscle aches or soreness. That's why one of the reasons I go see Daniel. Difficulty sleeping. I also know that one very well. However, how do you know if you actually have a diagnosis of anxiety? What I would say for that is for adults, you would have at least three of these symptoms. And for children, one is enough for us to think it's time to seek help. So if you are experiencing anxiety, I really hope and I want to encourage you and um, invite you to seek professional help because um, you don't have to live this way. All right, I'm going to toss the ball back to Daniel to look at the more medical side of this story. Great. Uh, Elaine, do you want to bring up that slide? Uh if you're ready, I'm happy to bring it up. Sure, why don't you bring that up? All righty. So uh, what I wanna talk about a little bit is the basics of you know, what's really happening oh. when we have anxiety and stress. And uh, from the most simple level, you can think about it as the nervous system. And the nervous system has two primary branches. One is sympathetic, and we've all heard of this, fight or flight. That's the sympathetic nervous system. And it was really designed for a short-term boost. It, shut down, it shuts down lots of other systems in our body when we're in the sympathetic state, which is really necessary you know, if we're trying to escape from danger or you don't have to give a presentation like this <laughs> and we're nervous about it. Um, that's the way it's supposed to work. But what's really happened, especially with modern humans, is that um, we get stuck in the sympathetic nervous state and um, we can't re relax into the parasympathetic nervous state, which is rest and relax. Uh, and so what happens when we're in this chronic state of, you know, stuck in sympathetic nervous system state is that it begins to affect all aspects of our body and, and mind. Um, you know, really typical symptoms that I see with, with my patients are, you know, difficulty concentration, um, palpitations, uh, you know, neck and shoulder pain in particular, because when we're in the sympathetic state, this muscle here that covers something called the vagus nerve that plays a big role in um, stress gets, gets very tight and it's pressing on that nerve and it's pressing on the, the veins and arteries going to the brain. Um, it suppresses our immune system in the sympathetic state. I see it all the time. Skin problems really have an anxiety stress origin to them. Gut problems um, almost exclusively in so many of my patients really come from anxiety and stress. And um, it also will, will begin to affect the reproductive system. So it's just a brief overview, but just to give you a sense that when we talk about stress and anxiety, what a profound effect it has um, on us as a whole, you know, nothing, sort of escapes the effects of chronic stress and anxiety. So one thing I wanted to show you, we want to, as we said before, we're gonna, we're gonna intersperse um, exercises throughout this. So one thing I wanted to show you today that helps actually calm the nervous system in a quick way, and I'll, I'll show you multiple ones from, from uh, an acupuncture perspective, but what I wanna show you today is a massage down the outside of your legs, so there is a bone on our lower legs, it's called the tibia, and it goes from the knee down to the ankle. And we all know what it is, it's easily, you can find it. I'm actually gonna to try to show you right now. So it's this, this bone right here in the middle. And all you're gonna do is you're gonna take two or three fingers and you're just gonna massage down the outside of that all the way to your ankle. 
and you're going to do that multiple times. You start, it's always best to start with the left side and then go to the right side. And you can do it for as long as you want, but really doing a minute or two on each side is all you need to, to get started. And that will actually impact the, the, the vagus nerve, the digestive system, and will help to ground you. So with that in mind, I wanna hand this back to Elaine, who's gonna talk more about the nervous system and temperament. I mean, talk about more about the, the vagus nerve and temperament. Thank you so much, Daniel. I really appreciate that. Um, I, I don't know, you've never taught me that thing with the tibia before, so I'm just so excited to have a new tool. And we hope everybody will have new tools um, as we go along today. Um, so one of my favorite, the vagus nerve is so important and there's so many different things that we can do for it. Um, and um, so many different techniques for sort of resetting the brain. So I'm gonna invite everybody to take your three fingers, it doesn't matter which hand, and put them above the other eyebrow. So I'm using my right hand above my left eyebrow. I'm gonna just take a moment, mute everybody. Um, and let's see, let me do that one more time. So um, take your fingers over your eyebrow and you're just gonna push hard enough that you're sort of making a dent in the skin. You can feel the bone through. Um, when I have my glasses on, I have to go around. So I'm gonna go out to the edge of the, the bone there across my temple, right down the top of my glasses, over the top of my ear, and then down around behind the ear, down the outside of the neck, over my collar, down the top of the shoulder, and out the outside of the arm. I'm still pretty pressing hard. And then I'm gonna just go out through, I think my ring finger, I'm gonna go through my ring finger, ring finger today and end at the tip of the ring finger. So we do that three times, but let's practice the other side now. So take your other hand and put it over your eyebrow, pushing in like a massage level, whatever feels good to you, out through the temple, around and behind the ear, down the side of your neck, over the top of your shoulder and down the outside of your arm and down through the ring finger, the third finger. As you do this, you can continue doing it while I talk. You do three on each side. I already just one on each side. I already have a little bit of a, just a tingling sensation in my body. And um, I'll, I will offer you a little bit more vagus nerve intervention soon. I want to explain a little bit why some people are more impacted by stress than others. It's kind of a frustrating thing to get right down to it, I'll say. But the, there is a, a really important reason, and it has to do with temperament. We're all born with very different ways of being in the world. So temperament innate is what, what it means when I say we're born with it. It's just who we are. It's probably makes up almost half of who we are. It's not a diagnosis, it's just the how, our behavioral style and response to environment. And there are many, many different models in psychology, but the standard model is generally considered to be based on Chess and Thomas's infant research on the nine temperaments. Oops, went too far. And so these are the nine temperaments and each one is a scale. So you could say on a scale of zero to one to 10 or a scale of one to five, our sensitivity to our environment is an example. So if you have a lot more sensitivity to your environment, you're going to be much more bothered by bright lights or scents or, um, you, well, you know, sounds. I have a big sound thing myself. So that's why I mute everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have to hear all the background noise. So sensitivity to your environment can be low, moderate, high, or anywhere in between. And you're just born that way. Activity level, some people are a lot more active. If you're a lot more active, you need a lot more activity in order to be at that optimal level of arousal I was talking about, which is unique for everyone. Intensity, how intense are you? Now, you can look down these. I'm not going to go every, over every single one. Um, I do temperament consultation and help people identify the unique temperament profile of each member of their family because we're all different. And it's really important that we honor and recognize the temperaments in ourselves and people in our family. But the most important thing is that we don't let it run our lives. So I often give the example, I'm quite a withdrawing person. I'm very introverted and slow to approach new. I like a lot of sensory input, but I like to think about it a lot before I approach. But I have a YouTube channel. 
So I work with my temperament because I have other goals, other things in my life besides temperament. Um, so I hope that's helpful and that you'll be thinking about those things. So there is this area in which I'm an expert. It's called highly sensitive people and the scientific name for the trait is sensory processing sensitivity. These folks are about 20% of the population and I'm gonna to venture to guess that probably at least half, if not three quarters of people attending this webinar today are have this trait of highly sens high sensitivity. You're born with it if you have it. How do you recognize it? You're a deep processor, you think a lot. You're easily overstimulated by all that thinking and all those emotional reactions that you have to all the things you notice. This is an acronym DOES, DOES, that we often use to identify sensitivity. So if you have all four of these things, you likely have this trait. All it means is that you have a finely tuned nervous system, but it means something else very, very, very important. And what that is, is that you are more impacted by stressors. And that's kind of the hard thing. Has it not been the most stressful time ever? So when you're more impacted by stressors, you will have um, more likelihood to enter into anxiety or depression, literally as a diagnosis, not just being stressed out. It's harder to maintain your optimal level of arousal because all of that thinking and feeling and noticing causes you to become overstimulated or over aroused. Now, here's the thing. This is the really good news and why the whole reason we're doing this webinar, even though you hear from Daniel and I that we're both introverts and a little stressed and anxious. <laughs> but the reason we're out here trying to help folks is because if you're highly sensitive, you are also more receptive and more impacted by intervention. So everything we teach you today will have a greater impact on those people with a more reactive brain or a finely tuned nervous system everything you do to help yourself, and we'll be talking, giving you tools and talking about other things that you can do, everything will help you. That is the good news. If you have a really intense temperament or you're a highly sensitive person. And let me see, I think that's all I'm doing. Yes, now I'm throwing it back to Daniel. Daniel, should I keep this slide up or bring it up later? No, sure, why not? Okay. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about stress and anxiety from the perspective of traditional Asian medicine, um, because I want to give you a sense of a sense of like the the depth. I mean, often things like stress and anxiety or or um, anything about mental health gets put in a in a box that we you know say is the brain. Um, and, and in tr many traditional medicines, it's all about interconnection between different systems. So. When somebody comes to me with stress or anxiety, I'm really looking to try to find the root. I mean, often by the time they come to me, they'll have affected multiple systems in their body, you know, whether it be the liver or digestion or anything else you could think of. And what I'm really after is, well, where's the root? What do I need to support? Is it really about um, their adrenal system? Is it really about um, an overactive, um, nervous system is an, you know, is there, is there really an origin in the respiratory system? I mean, nothing's off the table. And in traditional Asian medicine, each organ system actually has um, a particular emotion related to it. And so we're looking for, well, what's really under the anxiety? Is it really um, a deep anger that's affecting a particular system? Is it really, you know, some deep rooted fear? that's affecting something else like, like the kidneys or um, reproductive system. So, you know, it's, it's very complicated and we, we could spend a whole hour just talking about all these different interrelationships, but I just wanted to give you just a little, little taste of, of, you know, if you were to go seek help from a traditional practitioner, this is, these are the kinds of things they would be looking at. Um, but really what I wanna to go to is, is more about techniques of, of how to help with stress reduction. And here's a, something really simple from um, an acupuncture perspective. So the ear is its own acupuncture system. Auricular acupuncture is, is a whole study in and in of itself. And it's a really quick way to um, help calm yourself down. And if you look at this little graphic, you'll see a couple of, of points are highlighted. 
And one of those points says Shen Men, it's, it's up here in this, um, this part of the ear, if I can find it myself right here, up and up higher. It's, it's um, Shen Men actually means, it's a spirit point. It's incredibly calming. Um, and you can stimulate it just simply with your nail or just rubbing that area. The whole ear represents the entire body. And so one could massage the entire ear, could start with the Shen Men spot. Um, and also another particularly good one is right in the, the center here. And it's also highlighted with a, a purple square on the, the graph. That's another good place to, to start as well. It's very calming. It's called point zero. It's, it's an incredibly grounding point. And Wait, on the cartilage, second, Daniel, are, are you on right, the it's cartilage? On the, it's, on the, it's on the cartilage, yes. Okay, thank you. It's on the cartilage. So if you start at those two places and then you start working your way around, just gently massaging or pushing your entire ear, including the lobes, this is a good way, like literally within 15 to 20, 20 seconds to bring yourself back into, and you know, ground yourself, um, calm down in the moment. Um, it's a great technique for teens. I show this to teens all the time. Um, especially, you know, anything, anxiety around school or social interactions. And often many acupuncturists will, will pop a couple of these points in at the beginning of a treatment, especially if somebody who's coming in who's, you know, really in an, an over-sympathetic state, um, who's super anxious. This is a way to, to really start to get them to calm down even before the rest of the treatment. So, you know, give it a try right now, everybody. If you, if you want, um, starting with either the Shen Men or the one in the middle on the cartilage, the point zero, and just hold it for five or six seconds. Does it matter so, which ear or do you do both ears? It, you can do both ears at the same time. In fact, you can use the thumb as the presser and a finger behind, and you can push and start there and just start out from there. Um, Elaine sent me a great video the other day about the vagus nerve where a practitioner of um, some other modality was showing how much of this that's in this traditional Asian medicine system is, is actually really great techniques for affecting the vagus nerve. Maybe that's my jumping off point. Right. So why don't you jump, jump off, jump <laughs> on. Well, I'm going to say, actually, you can um, even grab your earlobes and pull them out and down. Um, and sometimes one works more, is more effective um, for than another. It's fascinating, I think. Um, so go ahead and um, experience that a little bit. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about tapping. Tapping is such a, an important, there's emotional freedom technique tapping, and you can look up Nick Ortner, if someone wants to throw that in chat on YouTube. He's got a lot of videos for um, tapping, which can help with bilateral brain stimulation. I'm going to start with my favorite one. I always tell people one hand after another, you just tap the top of your thighs and you can do it in inter any meeting. You can do it like this or just like this. So it's really quiet. Or you can take your whole hand and slap alternating which thigh, which hand, because when you do that, um, it helps break that. I call it the monkey mind or the hamster wheel, that cycle that your brain is spinning on. You can also feel to the back of your brain, your back of your head, the back of your skull, um, right in the, the, that dent where your first cervical vertebrae is. And that is a really good place to tap. So I'm just taking my fingers like this and I'm tapping. And you can tap with both hands back there. But while you're tapping, that's a great place for the vagus nerve. It actually is helpful to tap your whole head. So come on up over the crown and be tapping. You can tap all over your brain. It can be very helpful to tap right behind your ears while we're on the ear theme with Daniel. Just go ahead and keep tapping around on your brain. My recommendation is that you do this for 60 seconds. So I'm gonna stop and you keep tapping. 
Um, there's a lot of great tapping too um, with Nick Ortner about different places that you can tap on your body while you're saying affirmations. And that is a fabulous technique, lots of science backing up its ability to reduce anxiety. It's, it's quite amazing. I want to jump in for a little bit to the how I work, how we mental health people help people dealing with anxiety and stress and returning to optimal level of arousal. So I'll bring the slideshow back up for a moment. This is a typical cognitive behavioral therapy uh, diagram here. And what is so important, and you have all you know, seeing the law of attraction or the secret, or you know, and this is just the truth that physics, quantum physics has discovered for us that where we put energy grows. So this, this little diagram shows us that our thoughts create our feelings, our feelings create our behaviors, our behaviors reinforce our thoughts, and it is a self-fulfilling prophecy. So my question for you today is where can you jump off of this wheel? Where can you change? If you tend to have a negative thought, like I said, a lot of negative thoughts before we started. And I was kind of poking fun at myself a little bit saying, oh, I, this makes me so stressed and so anxious. But really the way I work with my brain is I say, I have an opportunity here to help a ton of people and to offer some of my wisdom in the world. And maybe you all will be interested in what I have to offer and you'll come follow me on YouTube or, or join my monthly webinars. You know, there's, there's all sorts of positive things about it. When I say that, then I feel great about being here on screen. When I feel great about it, I do a much better job of presenting. I mean, don't I seem like a basically happy person? It's not my natural temperament. Um, and so those thoughts, you know, then I create a self-fulfilling prophecy that is on the positive side. And that is such a relief to be on that circle, that wheel. So I invite you, and you're welcome to take a screen share. This as is being recorded and it will be available on YouTube afterwards. So how do you interrupt the cycle? There's just a few things you can do. The first one is careful thinking. Really be aware of what your thoughts are, like I just demonstrated with myself. Mindfulness is a great tool. And I'm not talking about mindfulness meditation here, although meditation is clearly a very important tool. I'm talking about just being in the moment. So just for a minute, I'm going to invite you to look around the room and notice five different colors that you see. What do those colors bring up for you? I'm looking at my one wall in my living room is actually painted a, a really beautiful deep indigo. It's my favorite sort of ocean color, but and you can't really tell this um, little couch and love seat I'm sitting on is a, is a deep teal. And I like to surround myself with the colors of the ocean. And I see six different um, blues or teals around me right now. And it makes me happy. And so I'm just focused in that moment. Therapeutic experiences. I mentioned that earlier. It's so important um, that we use the tools and, and professional help. If you're having three or more of those anxiety symptoms, courageous action, Courageous action, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to that because action isn't first, but courageous action is when you take the chance to think in a different way. So this is the step. These are the steps that I always preach. I got these from Al-Anon, actually, for families and friends of alcoholics. These are folks who um, really need to work on their stress and anxiety. Being aware that there's an issue is your first step. You have to really lean into that awareness, lean into the discomfort of the awareness. When you do that, then you may actually be able to move into acceptance, but it's just impossible to accept things that we're not fully aware of. You know what the word I'm dancing around here, that word is denial. And it's not just a, ri a, a river in Egypt, as we say. So being aware is the first step. Then you can accept what's going on and then you can take that courageous action. So here's how acceptance work. it's part of, works. It's part of that careful thinking piece. You identify what you can and cannot control. My technique, those of you who follow me, you know I love to say, put your hand in front of your face, four inches away. Use this hand. This is what you cannot control. Everything out here. What you can control is how you're thinking. So stop trying to change your anxiety. Instead, try to prevent it. But when you're in it, acknowledge that you're there so that you can do the self-care things that you need to do. And finally, redirect your attention toward the things that you can change. This is a serenity creed. And, you know, originally I learned it as a prayer, but in therapy now we're using it as a creed, as a mantra. And I use it often as a mantra when I'm feeling overwhelmed. So quick, grab your phone and take a picture of this. You can also look it up on Google. Think, you know, or whatever search engine you used. But the serenity creed, I'm going to go ahead and say it out loud because it's life changing. 
Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, all this out here. The courage to change the things I can, all this in here. And the wisdom to know the difference. The wisdom, that's the tough one, but I know you can do it. So back to self-care, I do want to just um, address this, throw out these things. Again, take a picture of this or a screenshot, because these are the my top five that we absolutely can do. Everybody can do something about this. So getting enough sleep every night. And if you are not sleeping, it is okay to lay in the dark with your eyes closed. If you're having anxiety when you're doing that, then I really recommend using an app to do guided meditation. And if that isn't working for you, my next best thing is a recorded book. And most library systems, you can get recorded books for free. There are lots of other apps that do, and there are on even on Audible and all the different places, there are sleep stories, um, like the history of math is one that we listen to in our family. Drink a ton of water, bathe, go listen to the water, wash your hands, face, even your feet, um, water on your wrists, but mostly be well hydrated. Nutrition care, I put food that nourishes, you know, traditional Asian medicine, Daniel will tell us that we need warm foods. Whatever works for your body is where I come from in my scope of practice. De-stressing activities, I think you all know what these are. They include meditation. If you have religion that has not traumatized you, embrace it and move into it. Tons of exercise, writing gets that stuff out of your head, let it be there. And finally, avoiding self-medicating is so important. And that means drugs and alcohol. Um, sometimes medication has a role and it can be very effective in treating anxiety. And, um, but we, you know, look, alcohol is a depressant. It, it, although it may take the edge off, if you drink enough, it just makes you depressed. And most most street drugs or even a lot of prescription drugs that we're not taking under the care of a physician um, exacerbate anxiety. Even marijuana, people think of it as a sedating or a calming drug. It's actually an all-arounder and it, and it can increase anxiety, especially if you're already leaning in that direction. And with that, I pass it back to Daniel. Hello again. So on to more little practices. Um, I just wanna say a word about, uh, Elena, I was so excited to see you doing the tapping on the, the occiput here, the, the, at the top of the spine, mm -hmm. the cervical spine, um, because that's a powerhouse of an acupuncture point. It's called Wind Mansion. And it's, it's really used when there needs to be like a whole reset of the nervous system. Um, especially like, you know, maybe there was physical or strong emotional trauma that's a good place to go to. So I love that you included in the, in the tapping routine. Another point I wanna talk about is, is on the opposite end of the body, on the bottom of the foot. And this is called kidney one. And I think this graphic shows it pretty well where it's at. Um, it's the start of the kidney channel, um, which is the, like the root. If you wanna think of it in like Western medicine terms, you could think of it as a channel affects the adrenal glands. So it's super um, grounding. And it's a really nice point to massage, especially for bed, if you're um, suffering from anxiety. And, you know, just like other things I've showed you, it doesn't take long to stimulate the point. It doesn't, it doesn't require super hard pressure. It can just be a gentle massage of that area, or it could be at any level of pressure that feels right to you. Um, and what I didn't put up there on the graphic is actually in the, the middle of the heel as another great calming and insomnia point. Um, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but it doesn't really matter. It's directly in the center of the heel. So if you massage that general area and you massage the two together at the same time, then you'll have even more of effect. Sometimes I, I, I do this in the middle of the day. Um, especially if I just feel thrown off track in some way. Um, it's a way for me to, you know, just take a minute and um, just come back into my body. And it's, it helps stop the story going on in my head. Uh, and then I get back to what I was doing. So I think what we're going to do now, I think Elaine has another exercise for us to do. And then we're going to go into some questions. 
So right, Laura and Bob are monitoring the chat for questions. And so you can put your questions in there. And um, I'll just keep us both up spotlighted now, Daniel, if um, Laura, if you can make sure that that's, that's happening. I can never really tell from my end. Um, so I, I want to just say I was going to put, and someone can put in the chat, please, um, tappingsolutionfoundation.org. That's Nick Ortner. And he, um, he has a YouTube channel for more tapping routines, which are really fabulously helpful. Um, let's see, I love all these things that stop the brain going all bonkers. Um, and I just taught this morning, so I'm gonna just overview. Most of you have heard, probably heard of this breath, but we forget, and it's my favorite one when I'm looking at a screen, and it's called the box breath. And so whatever screen you're looking at, whatever shape it is, we're going to breathe up the left side, hold our breath across the top side, exhale on the, on the right side, and then hold your breath out across the bottom. So usually we think of this as a box so that it's actually a square. And um, those of you who are astute on video can make your, um, your image there, make it not full screen and make it into a square if you like. Um, so I like to start with just a count of four. So we're just gonna inhale, two, three, four, Hold, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Now this interrupts, you see how, because you just naturally want to exhale, inhale again after the exhale at least. Most of us have been taught to hold a little bit after the inhale, um, like Andrew Wiles four, seven, eight breath. And there are many different counts where you inhale, you hold, and then you exhale. But very, very few breathing techniques have you hold after the exhale. And it just interrupts how your, your brain being on the circle. So you can take make your counts anything you like and just challenge yourself. So let's just take a moment to breathe only through the nose. So I'm not going to be able to do this because I'm going to be talking, but as you're breathing through your nose, make it whichever, whatever speed or depth that you want. You can challenge yourself. I know when I breathe more deeply, it really helps. And as you're breathing, I'm going to ask you just to bring your hands up and make some muscles right in front of you. We're going to squeeze our upper arms against our rib cage, pull our shoulders down and our elbows down toward our hip bones. Keep squeezing your fists, keep breathing through your nose. Keep squeezing your biceps, your forearms, push your shoulder blades down the back. Now let's engage our bellies and hold them really tight only breathing through the nose so that it's really a challenge. And now scrunch up your face and make all your facial muscles really, really tight breathing. Now take a big breath in and hold it for a moment and then release the muscles and exhale. So this is a, what, something that I learned from um, my personal trainer and colleague, Adam Hirsch. AdamHirsch.net is his website. And um, he teaches a lot of hard style plank. And by tensing all of the muscles in our body for a period of time, and again, if you can hold it for 60 seconds, then it, it's the same thing that you're supposed to do when you're trying to go to sleep is tense everything up and then just really let it go. Um, I'm gonna teach you one more. Can I do one more? Daniel. Okay. So this is called pinky thumb. And um, Daniel, if you'll put in the chat, the website, the YouTube video is brain power wellness. It's on YouTube. So brain power is one word and then wellness. So you'll stick your thumb out on one hand and your pinky out on the other. Now, some people switch their hands when they do it to cheat, but it's really hard if you keep your hands the same. So pinky thumb, and then we're going to switch. <laughs> you can do one hand at a time if it's really hard. And it helps to look at your hands. When you do pinky thumb like this, it challenges your brain to be here in the moment. Now, are any of these things enough to stop a panic attack? Maybe hard style plank could have a, a dent in it, but mostly we are not teaching techniques for stopping anxiety or stopping panic. What we are in fact doing is teaching preventive measures. Doing these things throughout the day can change your life and help keep you from moving up that crazy scale that we tend to get on. I'm wondering now, what I'd like to do is definitely take questions. I'm aware of the time. What if we also spotlighted Bob? Because I think he's going to ask the questions. Is that right, Bob? 
And um, yes, that is correct. Okay, let me see if I can put, put you on screen as well. Add spotlight. I think we should all be spotlighted now. Very good. So I guess this opens up the question and answer portion. Indeed. Okay, very good.